Good morning, everyone. Thank, thank you for coming to Grand Round. Um, today is the Judson Randall uh, Fellowship Celebration. Uh, for those of you who don't know who Judson Randall is or was, uh, he's really an icon in pediatric surgery and started the fellowship training program at Children's. Uh, he retired in 1991, so I was just thinking it's almost 30 years that his legacy, legacy still looms very large. Uh, if you go up to our Gazetta Library upstairs, and I'm sure a lot of you are going up there to our remiss, uh, because you know we share all the we share all the, the, the libraries now. You'll see a picture on the wall of all the luminaries who Judson Randolph trained. And amongst those names are Kathy Anderson. And Kathy was one of the first uh, presidents. She was actually the chief of surgery at uh, Los Angeles and then one of the first presidents of uh, the American College of Surgeons, uh, first female president. And then we've had luminaries like Phil Gazetta, who trained with him, and Phil was the chief at uh, Dallas and then came back on staff with us. And then, of course, Kurt Newman, who uh, was the chief of surgery here for a while, and then I'm not sure where he ended up after leaving the chief of surgery. Uh, oh, Kurt's not here. That's okay. Um, so, so, <laughs> so um, it's it's really a, a legacy that we're very proud of. Uh, a legacy not only at Children's to have J Judson Randolph's name attached to us, but really throughout pediatric surgery in North America. And it gives me a great pleasure today as our uh, fellowship speaker is Dan Von Allman, who is the uh, Senior Vice President and Surgeon at the Chief at Cincinnati Children's Hospital. Uh, Dan did his uh, general surgery training at Cincinnati Hospital as well as his pediatric surgery. Uh, he then spent a short time at UNC and went on to CHOP, uh, where he became associate professor, and from CHOP became the chief at UNC, and then was recruited back to Cincinnati as the chief of the division. And uh, in 2015, was appointed as the, uh, the chief of the surgeon in chief as well as the senior vice president. Dan is a prolific academic writer. He's a leader in the field. He, he really has uh, served in leadership positions on our major institutions, the American uh, Pediatric Surgical Association, and others. Uh, but more importantly, he's a terrific human being. And Dan uh, and I are, uh, we all have great colleagues in our field. But not all our great colleagues are great friends, and I can truly say Dan is a great colleague and a great friend. We spent a lot of time together in a hotel room in Philadelphia. Uh, you may be wondering why. <laughs> but it's really been stressing out uh, graduates in pediatric surgery trying to pass their oral board. So uh, we don't enjoy it very much, but we, it's almost like you know, we've been through something that's a unique experience together, luckily on the, on the easy side of the, of the hotel room. Anyway, it's a great pleasure today to have Dan here and visit us and uh, share some of his uh, expertise and intellect in uh, esophageal normal. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Tony. That's a, a very kind introduction. I'll tell you, it's, um, it's an incredible honor to come and speak on uh, a day that's here to honor Judd Randolph. And, we were speaking at dinner last night about that whole generation of pediatric surgeons and the incredible impact that they had on the way kids are cared for. And <clears throat> what I'm hoping to do today is uh, this is a great place, and I probably don't have a, a whole lot to share that's going to be new and exciting or different for you. But, but what, I, what I'd like to do is talk about how we've evolved in terms of care where uh, in Years past, the surgeon, it was all about the surgeon, and the surgeon was the only person, and uh, they were in charge of getting everything done. And you know, we've moved much more towards a cooperative kind of approach. It's um, esophageal challenges can be incredibly challenging. They are, when you go to the to sessions where they have um, uh, albatross cases, most of them turn out to be esophageal cases. They can just uh, very difficult. So if I can get this to advance, we'll actually. All right. Sorry. Uh, 
So I do have one uh, disclaimer or disclosure, and that is that I'm on the physician advisory board for Boulder Surgical. I'm not going to talk about anything that uh, has anything to do with that today. Uh, the objectives are really just to show you what we've been doing in terms of taking care of these complex esophageal patients. We have, as I said, a whole host of people who work on these from lots of different disciplines, and they all bring expertise that we tried to bring to bear on the individual patient. This is a, a kind of classic uh, x-ray that uh, when this shows up in the NICU, I think June and Rodrigo probably start doing high fives. And, you know, this is a great case. It's a classic pediatric surgical case, and the, the NG tube stops up in the upper thorax, and you can see it curled on the EAP. Uh, you can see gas in the stomach, which means this is uh, what is typically the most common form of esophageal atresia with tracheoesophageal fistula. And these, as you can see from the numbers from this old series, that's the vast majority of these cases, and they're great cases because you can take the patient to the operating room and frequently put them back together, and we do that primarily now and, and uh, orthoscopically in many places, uh, and the patients do great. But these can be really complex kids, and this is a diagram I like of the vacuole association that shows the various uh, associations with the all the different things that can go wrong with these children. And I just that picture on the on the right hand side there is the classic radial uh, forearm anomalies that you can see associated with esophageal atresia and the bacterial association. When you get this X-ray, though, this can be a little bit more concerning. These can be very challenging. Uh, this is a pure atresia, and the problem that we have is that we never know exactly what the gap is going to be. And the typical approach to that is to take the patient to the operating room, put in an and put in a G tube, and do a gap study. And when you do a gap study and it looks like this, you're excited and it's great because there's about a one vertebral uh, body gap, and that's something we typically think we're going to be able to just pull that together and, and get the primary anastomosis of the esophagus. Unfortunately, when you get a study that looks like this, it's considerably more difficult. And this is something that there have been a number of different procedures described, and I'll talk about them briefly, um, to try to pull these two ends together. The thing that we um, have been looking into is the fact that in order to get this information, you actually have to do a G-tube, right? Because the only way you can assess that distal pouch is uh, by putting a Hagar dilator up there, like on that picture, and doing it in x-ray so that you can actually see the gap. But we have, um, in Cincinnati, we, we have a prototype um, MRI scanner uh, that is actually in the NICU. It was developed in Cincinnati. It's a very small MRI scanner. It's, it's in the NICU itself. We are able to get uh, MRI scans on these neonates without having them have to have anesthesia. They're just, uh, they're given a little bit of sedation. And it's allowed us to do some research, and we have a very uh, great research group that is composed of our um, uh, neonatology group along with our research radiologists to look at segmenting those MRI studies to give us more information. So you get the typical MRI study that looks, you know, gives you the various different uh, planes. Uh, but then by segmenting out the data, it's possible to highlight the esophagus and the airway. And this is... Um, this shows you a number of things, but it, it's very helpful because you get some relationships that you wouldn't otherwise necessarily see. And you can see the significant angulation of the airway uh, caused by that dilated uh, proximal esophageal pouch. And in patients that have pure esophageal atresia or not, you can actually assess the distal pouch. And so uh, in this Using these uh, ultra-short echo time uh, MRI scans, you can actually picture and the, uh, the distal anatomy. It shows the location of the fistula to the airway, um, as well as the length of the uh, pouch if there is no fistula. This is another one that's uh, completely segmented out. This is a patient we did a couple of weeks ago. There was a question about a fistula to the left main stem bronchus, which is unusual, and in fact, that's what we found in the operating room, so it was very helpful and that we were expecting that when we went to the OR. Um, but it's not perfect. This is another case, a uh, recent case, 
where it was unclear whether there was a fistula to the left main stem bronchus or not, but it didn't make any sense based on that distal pouch. It shouldn't come from the middle of the pouch. It should end there. And in fact, in the operating room, we found the tr typical type C tracheosophageal fistula several centimeters above the carina. So it's far from perfect, but it is very helpful in helping us to understand what the anatomy is and what the relationships are to the surrounding tissues as opposed to just putting an NG tube in and taking an x-ray. And that team has done some work to, to look at what's the implication of that. And so doing things like measuring the diameter of the proximal pouch and trying to associate that with clinical outcome. In this case, there's a significant difference in esophageal disc motility based on the dilation of the proximal pouch. And that kind of makes sense. And is that useful? I don't know. We're still, you know, we have not a whole lot of experience with it. We're still learning. But it is a technique that we can use to try to develop these relationships. Uh, you can correlate it with the type of the uh, anatomy uh, seen. And again, this makes perfect sense to do not have a proximal tracheoesophageal fistula. That correlates with broader diameter of the pouch, as you would expect, and that is associated with more angulation of the airway. You can also um, correlate this with the number of dilations that a patient will require, again, based purely on the anatomy of the proximal pouch. One of the things that has become a topic of a lot of conversation, a lot of um, uh, new procedures controversy is the issue of tracheomalacia. And that's the ability uh, or the association of weakness in the trachea associated with esophageal atresia. And what, if anything, do we need to do about that? And it's very unclear. And there are a number of procedures that have been uh, proposed. There are, there are a, a whole spectrum of, of approaches that are either very, very aggressive or the complete opposite end of the spectrum where nothing is done at all. But what this MRI allows us to do is actually follow a respiratory cycle. And this gives us anatomic information about how the trachea is moving during respiration. And that is something that unless you, uh, unless you do a scope, you can't get that information. And even when you do a scope, it doesn't give you the full uh, anatomic associations that you can see with this MRI. So again, we're not sure how this is going to help us, but I think this will give us some objective data that will allow us to assess to what degree the patients um, require intervention for that tracheomalacia. If you look at the tracheal deviation that I showed you on the first slide, you can actually correlate that with the duration of postoperative respiratory support. So there's some correlation between what you see on the MR and the functional status of the, of the trachea. Interestingly, this is a series of scans, uh, first a pre-repair, the second scan, and you can see the significant tracheal deviation caused by that proximal pouch. Uh, the second scan shows you uh, post-immediate post-repair scan, and the third study is um, two weeks post-repair. And over the course of those three scans, you can see that the trachea actually significantly straightens uh, with presumably less impact on uh, respiratory status. So information we're, we're learning what to do with, uh, but it's, it's potentially very valuable information for predicting uh, what the child will do clinically. Uh, this is just the research group working on a call. Sigma is one of our uh, neonatologists, and we have the Cincinnati Children's Image uh, IRC or Imaging Research Center uh, where most of this work is being done. So in terms of, let's go back to the patient and the challenging patient, the patient with the long gap, and uh, what's, what are the options? Um, there are lots of options. It used to be when I trained and probably when Tony trained, since we trained at the same time, that patient would go to the operating room, we'd do a spit fistula and a G-tube, and at some point later they'd come back for a replacement of some type. Now, we rarely end up in a position where we have to do an esophageal replacement for pure esophageal atresia. We're much more commonly able to get the two ends together, and there are a number of uh, procedures that have been Described for that, these elongation techniques, probably the most well-known is John Foker's technique, um, but there are others. Uh, and if that doesn't work, then we resort to, to one of the replacement techniques. The Foker technique, for those of you who are not familiar with it, involves putting traction sutures in the ends of the, the two ends of the esophagus, uh, 
Um, and gradually over time, uh, those traction sutures are brought out through the chest wall and every day you go by and put a little more traction on it and uh, theoretically induce growth of those two esophageal segments. And I personally believe that, that stretch or pressure is a very strong stimulus to growth. There's an argument over whether this is just stretch or is it actually growth. I think that it probably is growth. Um, but it's a, a procedure that uh, was hard for people to replicate. And this is data that comes from uh, Boston Children's and Rusty Jennings uh, is the primary advocate of this and has uh, learned with John Poker. And they published this paper in, I think, 2015 in JPS. And it was great because it is a very, very comprehensive review of what their results are. And there are two, two groups, the primary uh, um, cases in which they did the initial operation there and, and they provided all of the surgical care, and secondary cases where the patient's initial operation was performed somewhere else and they got the patient as a referral. And in the patients that they were able to operate on from the beginning, they were able to achieve esophageal continuity in 96% of the patients. In the secondary patients, so only about two-thirds were they able to get the uh, esophagus together. But I think the other important findings of this was that this is not uh, for the faint of heart. These kids have significant morbidity associated with uh, getting the esophagus together. In the primary patients, they spent more than two months in the hospital and spent more than two weeks paralyzed. In the secondary cases, they spent almost four months in the hospital and four weeks paralyzed. So that's, that's some... You know, that's a lot uh, to get the two ends together. And unfortunately, when you look at how many of those kids are actually able to eat, only about two-thirds of the kids are able to eat with a primary anesthesia where they took care of the child from a primary standpoint, and less than 10% for those um, in whom they had a secondary uh, approach to the, to the defect. So results that we can certainly improve on. Another technique that I'm personally more enamored with was developed by David Vanderzee. And on the x-ray on the, on the left here is what I used to do. If I got into the OR and I couldn't get the two ends together, I would just tack the two ends to the prevertebral fascia with a little bit of tension on it and wait for a while and then go back and, and try to pull the two ends together. David Vanderzee actually, his approach has been to put traction sutures in the two ends, bring them out, not pull on them or do anything like, uh, like the poker approach, but go back three days later, break up the adhesions, and this is all done thoracoscopically as opposed to the poker approach, which is helpful. Go back three days later, mobilize the adhesions that form, and I thought three days there aren't going to be any adhesions, but there actually are. It's fixed, and so you go back, mobilize it up, put it on a little more tension, go back after a few more days, and usually you can get the two ends together. So it's a much faster approach than the um, than the FOCR procedure, and obviously there's not going to be a lot of growth over that time frame, so that's more likely to just be stretched. In fact, at one conference he was talking about, if you get them close but they're not quite close enough, just go have a cup of coffee and come back and you'll be able to get the two ends together. So, that technique has now been modified, and instead of bringing the sutures out, you can place these sliding knots, and this is a video of, um, of one of his colleagues doing this, and it's done again thoracoscopically. You mobilize the two ends of the esophagus, put these sliding knots on, and just keep gently pulling them together until you get the two ends uh, in apposition. Wait a little bit and come back, and you can take the ends off and do your esophageal anastomosis. So you can see the two ends are immediately approximated, and that's a relatively tension-free anastomosis. So there's always been a saying in pediatric surgery that I'm sure all the surgeons in the room know about that uh, every effort, there is no good replacement for the esophagus, and you should do whatever it takes to, uh, to preserve the native esophagus. But I would argue that there are cases where that probably is not a great idea, and you get to the point where there's so much morbidity associated with the complications that you should just replace the esophagus. There are multiple procedures for that, and as I always say, whenever there are multiple procedures for something, it means that none of them work very well or everybody would do the same thing. So the gastric pull-up 
again, for, for students or residents uh, who are not familiar with it, uh, involves mobilizing the fundus of the stomach, pulling it up. Uh, you can pull it all the way up to the neck and doing an anaphthalmosis with the uh, fundus of the stomach ending up in the posterior mediastinum. This is, there is a surgical advisory group to the International Esophageal Atresia Association, and if you have to replace the esophagus, this is what is recommended as the first option by that group. Another older option that some people still do, I don't know whether you guys do any of these here, is a reverse gastric tube. I, uh, I actually have a picture of one. Uh, this is from my residency because I haven't seen or done one since, but um, but it involves taking the greater curve of the stomach and using that as creating a tube out of that and using that as the uh, conduit to replace the esophagus. And then there's colon interposition. And I trained in Cincinnati, and Cincinnati was a colon interposition place, and so we learned that's the replacement strategy that we learned. It, it has a number of advantages and disadvantages, just like everything else. One of the advantages to it is that you can generate a very robust blood supply. And if you, you can use either the right side or the left side, and typically what I do is do a laparotomy on the patient and look at the marginal arteries, at the marginal vessels along the colon, and pick whichever side has the best blood supply. Then you can mobilize a, a ton. You can get a huge amount of distance. And so it's particularly useful in patients with either bad caustic ingestions or other things where the entire esophagus is uh, damaged. And we have used these colon interpositions to sew directly to the pharynx because you can get so much length on it. And that's a little tougher to do with a gastric, gastric pull-up. I've never actually tried that. When you're done with it, you can, first of all, you can either put it retrosternal or in the posterior mediastinum. So uh, there are kids whose posterior mediastinum is a mess from multiple, multiple operations and complications. And so you can very easily put it through the uh, just create a substernal pocket and put it underneath the sternum, um, or you can pull it through the um, uh, pull it through the native esophageal bed. And when you do it, it looks great, and they're nice and straight, and everything looks wonderful. The problem with the colon interposition is that over time, uh, the end of it typically becomes an S curve, and it dilates and it elongates, and that's a problem because then they end up with kids end up with poor emptying, and it. I was taught that once this happens, you're really stuck because this is really hard to do anything about because of the tenuous blood supply. And I found that that's actually not the case. It's actually relatively straightforward through a laparotomy to go in, pull that redundant part of the colon down, um, preserving the marginal artery that goes up to the upper part of the esophagus, and just reanastomosis to the stomach. So the bad news is the child needs another operation. The good news is you can actually fix this, and over time it becomes less and less of a problem. So we looked, uh, when I first started, we did a number of these, and again, we don't do nearly as many as we used to because we're a lot better at just getting the esophagus together. But we looked at a series of 13, uh, 12 of the 13 patients were NPO, completely NPO at the time of the initial evaluation. Um, Five of them, interestingly, had associated complex airway issues that had to be dealt with either concurrently or during the same um, admission. <clears throat> Five of them, as I noted before, were from these complex caustic injuries where severe caustic injury that involved the entire esophagus. Um, three had recurrent, recurrent strictures with pulmonary complications related to the fact that they uh, uh, had continued aspiration from their esophageal strictures. Uh, and two, the had had two kids that had previous, uh, pre pre multiple previous attempts at repair and had been left essentially without an esophagus. And then two were the long gap esophageal atresia kids. And those are kids that we probably would be able, in many cases, to get together without uh, requiring a replacement. It is not, unfortunately, it's not uncommon to get a leak. And that usually occurs from the proximal anastomosis. And one of my scientific colleagues tells me that's because the esophagus and the colon are different types of tissue and they don't heal well together, and that's why it leaks. Uh, the good news is that if you just wait and do nothing, most of those uh, leaks go away very quickly. We did have a high incidence of stricture at the upper anastomosis, essentially none at the gastric anastomosis, but eight of those 13 required um, recurrent uh, dilations. We did lose one graft was unclear why the child was very unstable, had a bunch of cardiac issues, and we ended up taking out the graft just because we weren't sure what was going on. 
Um, so you can lose the entire um, pull through. I also have a patient who had a, gas, a um, colon interposition elsewhere that's strictured down to almost nothing, and we were able to redo that with the other side of his colon. So you can, you do get essentially two swings of this. Of the patients who required dilations, uh, half of them required a lot of dilations, like more than 10. Uh, the other half, not so many. We always do balloon dilations. So this is in collaboration with our GI colleagues who do the interventional stuff, and they actually do the balloon dilations. Um, it's way more common, as you would imagine, in the patients with caustic injury to require recurrent dilations because their esophagus is damaged across the entire length of the esophagus. So even if it looks okay where you sew it back together, it's still not normal. Just to give a demonstration of a case that we had, uh, we received, this child was transferred to us, a five-year-old uh, with trisomy 21, who had started with a long gap esophageal atresia, had multiple attempted poker procedures, um, ended up with lots of complications from that, leaks, a pulmonary hemorrhage. And she, when she came to us, she essentially had, she was trach dependent, um, vented, and had a red rubber catheter coming out of her neck because there wasn't enough esophagus to actually create an esophagotomy. And so uh, she underwent, uh, after a lot of work, ended up undergoing a, um, a colon interposition. And her mother, I love this, her mother term, coined this term the colophagus. And that, that's what she calls the, uh, the replacement of the, her child's esophagus with this piece of colon. And as you can see, you can get a, that's the neck incision off on the right and the abdominal incision. Uh, in the upper left-hand corner, and you can get plenty of length to put it all the way up to the pharynx, which is essentially what we did in this child. And, you know, everybody always shows their best results, but this child actually did incredibly well, and her mother continues to send me uh, on her, I can't say the word because it's too long, because she's convoluted, but her colossal adversity or whatever, that every year she sends me a picture and a video of this child eating uh, and her clophagus. Uh, which, which is amazing. So, so you can do well, even though the colon interposition gets a bad rap, uh, it actually can work well as a durable long-term uh, replacement. One of the other groups that we have in our, in our center is our feeding team, and they work very closely with us. And they, uh, they, it's a combination of speech therapy and our gastroenterologists. They follow all of these kids carefully. And there's a lot of data, and I'm not going to go through all this data uh, study by study, but there's a lot of data about the dysfunctional um, feeding and swallowing um, from patients who have had esophageal atresia repair. They have problems with delayed onset of swallowing. They have issues with aspiration in as many as a third of the patients um, and just don't do well, even if it's their own esophagus. They have, all have problems with esophageal dysmotility. So we actually took a look at a number of our colon interposition kids to see how they do and found, I think, relatively uh, encouraging results. The age range was from two years to 16 years. Um, again, caustic ingestion was the most common. Uh, long gap esophageal atresia was about a 50-50 split. Um, and these were all co colon interpositions. They're studied with... Uh, or they're evaluated with a scale that's on the right there, um, everything from level one, which is essentially they can't take anything by mouth, to a level seven, which is they eat normally with no restrictions. These patients were all evaluated with uh, video swallowing studies by our uh, feeding team group. And what they found is that um, about 15% of the patients were totally, they were they were a level six or seven, they could take anything they wanted by mouth and they eat their full oral diet by mouth. About um, half or a little more than half required some supplemental enteral feedings, but were essentially able to eat normally uh, with some pureed or whatever modifications of their diet. And 28% uh, were taking case only and really required almost full enteral support. So the patients, um, the good news is uh, that if you look down at aspiration, 85% uh, of the patients were able to eat something with no aspiration. So while 15% is not zero, at least most of these kids are still able for comfort, if nothing else for comfort, able to um, eat by mouth. 
It does take some modifications of the way they swallow, and so three-quarters of the kids actually use um, strategies to help them swallow better. We have kids who get this bullfrog thing in their neck sometimes where the, you can see the, uh, the colonic interposition fill up, and we even have one child who will literally push it down with her hand uh, to make the stuff go down, so it is far from perfect. The problem, um, so those are, those are difficult cases and we get through them and the kids do well. Some of these kids who have come to us because of largely, honestly, because of our airway center um, are kids with lots of really significant long-term complications. And these are the ones that really require the multidisciplinary approach. They're kids with stricture who have pulmonary uh, issues related to gastroesophageal reflux, uh, recurrent tracheoesophageal fistulas, and I think that's where one of the places where I have learned the most uh, working with our ENT surgeons, um, and then issues of feeding and dysmotility. The complication rate for esophageal replacement is high, and there, this is some data. There are lots of different studies that show lots of different rates for the various different interventions, but all the rates are high. So, so they're bad problems. And you get these kids, and they look sometimes like this, then the upper study is a contrast study showing a essentially completely trashed esophagus. Many have had many, many interventions, uh, and their chest wall looks like that on CT scan. I had one child where I had to use a sternal saw to do a posterior lateral thoracotomy because the entire right side of the chest had just used into a bone. Um, and so we've developed an approach, again, it's just our approach um, for dealing with these, and I understand that you guys have a great aero center as well. In our center, uh, we have wonderful support from our nurse practitioners, and they do a lot of work before we ever see the patient to get a full medical history. Uh, when they come, we schedule patients to come for an evaluation for two or three days. They get um, contrast studies. We get a high-resolution CT on most of them because many have bronchiectasis and other pulmonary complications. Um, we do a swallow study. They get a study to look at vocal cord function. We had one woman who came... Uh, who was in her 40s who said, oh, every time I get a cold, I lose my voice. But we checked her and she had one of her vocal cords out and nobody had ever told her that. So, um, so we try to do a very complex evaluation or a very complete evaluation. And then we take them to the operating room with the entire group. So surgery, pulmonary, GI, and ENT, we have joint operating room time on Wednesday afternoons, which sounds like you have a similar setup here, which is great. Um, but it allows us to do that evaluation with all the people who might be intervening in the room so that we can all talk about what do we think we need to do with this particular case. It is not uncommon to sometimes have two scopes in at the same time, the DI scope in uh, from below or above and the, the bronch, uh, flexible bronchoscope in. All of the kids get a flex bronch, they all get a, a rigid bronch, and they all get endoscopy. We're then able to go out and talk to the family about what the options are uh, as a single team, and that has a lot of value for the parents. We try to take this sort of laddered approach where we start with endoscopic interventions, if we can, to minimize the trauma to the patient, and then move through open surgical approaches, which can either be uh, transcervical, uh, transtracheal, or standard thoracotomies. If none of that works, then we'll consider replacement. And then in very rare cases, we've actually just bypassed the esophagus because we thought it was too dangerous to take out because there were multiple, multiple tracheosophageal fistulas and we weren't sure there was enough viable trachea to essentially preserve the trachea. Strictures are the nemesis. We all have had problems with strictures. They can be recurrent and very difficult to deal with. Um, dilations, and typically we do balloon dilations. Um, recurrent dilations, we'll dilate a child every couple of weeks we need to for a long period of time. We've injected steroids, mitomycin, and F5-FU. All of those things are somewhat helpful in some cases, but uh, not a panacea in terms of resolving the problem. And we've used stents. And our experience with stents, although it continues to change because new stents continue to be av available, but our experience with stents has been you put a stent in and it works great. A child can swallow and everything is great, and you take the stent out and it goes right back to where it was before. So we've not been able in many of the patients to actually preserve a wide esophageal lumen using a stent. One of the techniques that I was not familiar with that came from uh, our interventional gastroenterologist is using, using needle knife. 
Sorry, I have no idea why that happened. Looks great on my computer. <laughs> Sorry, but anyway, so we so using a needle knife, it's it's something that uh, we can do endoscopically. It works best for eccentric um, strictures. There may just be a pinhole in a, a lateral area of a short, relatively short stricture, and essentially, it's a way to endoscopically incise the stricture then dilate, and it gives us a more durable result um, from that dilation. I'll show you a picture in a minute if I can. Promising. Changed. There we go. There we go. Sorry for the. Oops. Uh, sorry for the delay there. So anyway, this is a picture that shows you the that very tight stricture in the in the top left, and then incising that stricture and dilating it and allowing it to heal. Go and just another um, another series of pictures with the same effect: a short uh, web-like stricture, and then an incision in the lateral aspect of that. And obviously, you want to stay away from the trachea when you incise the stricture because you don't want to create an tracheostomal fistula. The other problem we see frequently, and this is where we've had a great, uh, I personally have had a great experience and learned a ton from my ENT colleagues, is patients who have recurrent tracheosophageal fistulas. And these can be traumatic or primary or missed, uh, missed primary. Um, they are something that we deal with, again, with a laddered response. And if possible, we use an endoscopic approach first. If that doesn't work, then we will uh, attempt an open approach. Many of these patients have had multiple attempts to fix these fistulas before. So they can be quite complicated and we end up um, with a technique that I've learned from our ENT folks, which is the slide tracheoplast. So I'll just show you a couple pictures of how that works. Endoscopically, there are a number of different techniques that have been described. We use what's called a bug decautery. And basically what you want to do is just de-epithelialize that fistula tract. We do that, we often will put a scope in the esophagus as well as a scope in the bronch in the trachea and pass the probe through the, um, through the fistula and try to burn out all of the endothelium. <laughs> Sorry. Anyway, you can the bug be cautery, you can actually stick it through. Now, the reason we put a scope in the esophagus is to make sure we don't burn all the way through the esophageal wall. So we want to get the entire tract uh, cauterized. It works best if you have a long sort of oblong tract. 
Uh, we then put an endotracheal tube in and blow up the cuff right at that area. And the idea is to try to keep those two deepithelialized surfaces pushed together for a couple of days to get them to stick and reduce the um, chance that you're going to get a recurrent fistula or persistent fistula. It sometimes takes two or three attempts at that to actually get the fistula to, to seal completely. If it doesn't, then we move on. And the technique uh, that we have used most frequently in these recurrent, recurrent fistulas is um, a slide tracheoplasty. This was a technique that's been developed for use in patients who have um, tracheal stenosis. Um, but it works very well for tracheosophageal fistulas. We um, have reported a series of 10 of these cases. You can see on the video there that very large um, tracheosophageal fistula at the bottom where that tube is now being passed through. You could actually drive the scope right through that. Um, so it's, it can be, they can be quite large. This is a case, again, this is a recent case just to give you an idea of how complicated these can be. Uh, we were sent a patient, a 17-year-old patient with Hurler's syndrome, who was taken to the OR, an outside OR, for uh, tympanostomy tubes, had an airway issue there, ended up having an emergent trach, and then developing a traumatic tracheosophageal fistula. He was transferred for evaluation with actually a very unstable airway. And when we did the scope, and this is a little bit hard to interpret, but the scope there, he actually had a six and a half centimeter long tracheoesophageal fistula that went from two centimeters above, that's the endotracheal tube. The, the scope is in the esophagus, and that's the endotracheal tube that you can see along the entire length of the, uh, the uh, trachea. So a very, very long, um, large tracheoesophageal fistula. The NG tube that he came with actually went through the cords out through the tracheosophageal fistula and down into the stomach. So it ultimately got to where it was supposed to be, but it wasn't taking quite the right path. So uh, we ended up taking that child to the operating room. <clears throat> we did it in our hybrid OR, which helped because we could use fluoro to help position things. Um, but we put the child on bypass, fem-fem uh, ECMO, basically, at the beginning of the case, and then did it through a median sternotomy, an anterior approach, uh, we're able to divide the trachea, separate the esophagus off the back wall, repair the esophagus, um, and put some periosteum, actually, that was harvested from the tibia, tibial periosteum, in between the, uh, the esophagus and the back wall of the trachea. And much, a lot of the trachea was just gone, and we ended up doing a spike tracheoplasty to pull the trachea back together over that. It was um, challenging. I think the child lost two and a half liters of blood, um, but he was did very well. And this is his post-op um, endoscopy that you can see uh, the trachea on the left-hand side and the uh, esophagus on the right. And as you get as the uh, scope comes out of the esophagus, you'll see the sutures um, in the upper part. They see the sutures there where the esophagus was repaired, but at least. To date, knock on wood, uh, he has not had a recurrence of that. It was a real challenge. It was a challenge to get a trach into him. We had to take out part of his manubrium so that we could have enough space to put a trach in because of his hurlers and very short neck. So a challenging case, but just an example of how working together as different subspecialties, you can all bring some expertise to these very complicated kids um, to get uh, hopefully a good long-term result. This is just a diagram of how the slide tracheoplasty works uh, for tracheosophageal fistula. It involves a tracheoplasty, involves splitting the trachea, dividing the trachea, split the back wall in one direction, and split the front wall in the other direction, and literally slide them across each other. Again, developed for patients with tracheal stenosis. When you use it for uh, tracheosophageal fistula, you can actually leave a little piece of the trachea, little wings of the trachea, and fold them over the fistula site to close that, and then uh, we usually take some sternal periosteum and put that between the esophagus and the trachea and do the tracheoplasty uh, over top of the repaired fistula. As I said, we've done 10 patients, or we reported 10 patients. We've done way more than 10 patients. Um, all of them were successful. Two required a revision, and those were both actually button battery ingestion kids, and those like the cost of ingestions, there's diffuse damage to the esophagus, and I think we underappreciated how much of it was damaged. 
Most of them can be done transcervically. Uh, occasionally, uh, there are some of the patients who had to be done on bypass, uh, and they're done with our, either our cardiac group or like the patient I described, we can put them on 7 7 backbone. So finally, um, none of these results are great, and that's the problem we have is we haven't really figured out the right answers. And so there is a lot, a lot of work to be done. And the question is whether there is, uh, ultimately, there will be help uh, in science. And uh, you have great scientists here doing great things in neuroblastoma and other stuff. I have a colleague who is working with our developmental biologists, uh, working on uh, using stem cells um, to recreate the bowel. And they have successfully, working with the developmental biologists, they've been able to take uh, cells, drive them backwards to be stem cells, and then drive them forward to be any piece of intestine from the mouth to the anus. And it is fully developed intestine, so it's not just the epithelium, muscular layer, it's everything. It's really, um, it's amazing science fiction -y stuff. Uh, and I think you'll probably have a, an opportunity in the future to hear from somebody who knows way more about it than I do. But um, uh, they're very proud. He's very proud of the fact they've had their stuff not just in nature, which I can barely read the table of contents, and their stuff ends up on the cover. Uh, so it's really sophisticated research, and the hope is that ultimately they're going to be able to take these IPS cells and generate a new esophagus. In the interim, though, one of the things that we've thought about most recently is that you can, like, you can heal a gastric ulcer just by injecting these IPS cells into a gastric ulcer. And I showed you those pictures of what the esophagus looks like when you dilate it, and it's all beat up. So potentially, we could do one of those aggressive dilations, beat the esophagus all up, inject IPS stem cells that are um, destined to be esophagus, and have them actually provide us with a full thickness repair that will heal in a much, um, much more durable, normal fashion without causing recurrent stricture. And then one of the things, I love this video on the, you know, you, Growing that tissue is great, but the tissue intestine works by peristalsis, and that requires an enteric nervous system. And these guys have figured out actually how to insert an enteric nervous system into their uh, intestinal organoids. So that on the right-hand side is this video with these reporter uh, genes that every time the nerve fires, it lights up like that. So they've actually created full thickness intestine, normal intestinal wall with um, an enteric nervous system that functions, and this is one of uh, their enteroids that's implanted in the capsule of the kidney, and you can see it peristalsing. So pretty cool stuff, not exactly ready for prime time, but they have moved it into large animal studies, and uh, it's very exciting uh, potential help for the future. So finally, I, I would just, again, first of all, thank you immensely for the incredible honor of being the Randolph a visiting professor. Uh, he is an icon in pediatric surgery. Um, you know, they dealt with things like esophageal atresia with a lot less resources than we have and probably had results that in some ways are just as good. So we still struggle with this. They're uh, extremely challenging cases. Getting everybody's ideas on how to fix it coming from multiple different disciplines I think is very helpful. Um, you have to be very aggressive in some of the cases and we still have a lot to learn. Maybe there will be an answer in the future coming from science. So again, thank you. I appreciate immensely the opportunity. Uh, these are some folks from at the esophageal atresia meeting who all have colon interpositions. So you can actually grow this woman, the short woman there, was one of the first colon interpositions done in England. Um, and I can't give you the date because I can't remember it, but she's a wonderful woman. And, uh, there, these are great people that come to the meeting as patients to help us understand the impact of what we do on the patients. So thank you.